Welcome again to the Tulsa Croquet Club, northeast corner of La Fortune Park in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Just north of the tennis courts, you can see the two courts we've played on in Tulsa for years. Above that, in the long rectangle, is the new complex of four courts. The incoming president of the Croquet Club is Anna Hansen, who is also the tournament director of this golf croquet event that's a companion tournament to the Midwest U.S. Rules Regional Labor Day weekend 2022. The golf croquet games were all played on that court at the top of that rectangle. Brian Hovis is your videographer, commentary by yours truly, Russ Dilley. This tournament features a number of locals from Tulsa and Oklahoma City and five players from the Oklahoma Wesleyan University croquet team, which won the most recent collegiate national championship. It's better to get some. I'll get some of our shots. And now some golf croquet from the heartland. Yeah. Fun. David Watson there playing blue and black, and Morgan Lane playing nope, red and yellow. Oh, sorry. This is a double elimination so. format, and they both got eliminated in the Actually, winner's bracket. This is the second round of the loser's bracket. These two, along with most of these players, are relatively new to the game. I think David plays locally. Morgan is involved at Oklahoma Wesleyan University. I'm going to edit this to be a bit of a highlight reel. These two developing players provide plenty of opportunity to illustrate <laughs> tactics, <laughs> technique, and the yeah. rules. The usual picture of this that will turn out to be the longest hoop shot of the game. Stuart Price is, I think, very committed to supporting the uh, collegiate golf croquet activity and it was his generous donation that allowed us to do these golf croquet videos. This game is double banking with another loser's bracket game. Lena Casimir there behind Morgan is playing their coach. Steve Fisher coming on screen there. Stanley Fisher, his son, will feature in a, a game later. It looks like the Oklahoma Wesleyan group is playing Don Oakley's Brighton mallet. It's a good club mallet. Those are the ones that I started my uh, club here in Indianapolis with. David's weapon is homemade, cool looking, all white. I suggested he call it Excalibur or one of the unpronounceable Welch versions of that name. Putting balls together like this so they basically can't do anything is called cuddling or snuggling. And despite the eyebrow-raising nature of the terminology, it can be the most powerful tactic in the game because there is basically no response. Well, 
when they get serious, they'll be calling a referee for this shot, which is hampered both by the hoop and those balls. And sure enough, there's a beveled edge, which is a fall. The balls would go back. Big risk of a double tap here. It looks like he knows that because he's trying to hit a stop shot, but they're so close together. Again, a referee would have been appropriate. It's yellow to play, but nobody noticed, including me and your videographer, Brian Hovis. Had they realized what happened, it would have been David's choice of replace and replay, in which case red goes back and she plays yellow, or they swap the positions of yellow and red and blue plays. Exactly this scenario, except red and yellow are swapped. You're going to have to read the rule book to get this straight, and it will take several readings, I promise. And the complexity is not just because the World Croquet Federation is out to get you, it's because it is complicated. As it stands, Blue is playing a wrong ball as well. Morgan then went to try to play yellow because she had just played red. We intervened in a fairly clumsy fashion, I'm afraid. Maybe we should say, can we say something? Yeah. Hey, guys. It would have taken me three minutes to get out there to help fix it. So the final decision was to have her play red, which condoned Blue's wrong ball, and they moved on. With time, she'll learn to hit that shot hard. This is good. Long ball rules in order to avoid to get the hoop. So it might be complicated. I'm not sure I understand. Yellow's only okay. real choice here is so to go out of bounds on the north boundary just short of off sides to set up for hoop three. It's amazing how at the national the shit never came up. I mean, nobody ever going to. Entertaining option here would be to just graze black, give it the hoop, but put red over near hoop three somewhere, legally off sides. It would be legally off sides if it gets there off an opponent ball or in the stroke that scores the hoop. So if yellow were in black's position, then red could use the same tactic. And here we are after their approach shots to hoop three.
the usefulness of jawsing odd numbered hoops to give yourself a chance to make two hoops in a row isn't clear to these players yet, but they'll figure it out. Had she been able to jaws yellow, that would have held blue and black back, unable to go more than halfway to hoop four, which she could have approached then on her hoop shot at three. And, of course, this only works for odd number of hoops because the next hoop can be approached on the hoop shot. In even numbered hoops, you have to turn right or left to get to the next hoop. Here comes a proper clearance in the double bank game. I only show this because hitting these shots hard enough is something that developing players are afraid to do in the beginning. And of course, you don't have to murder it. You have to hit it center ball, which is what transfers most of the energy of your stroke into the ball you're trying to clear. These games have a 75-minute time limit. A ball close to the hoop like that provides a double target opportunity for Red in this case. She could shoot at the stanchion and she'll either knock Blue well away or make the hoop one of the two. She could also set up on a line from that stanchion through the center of Blue so that she's wired from Blue because Blue doesn't have a backswing. This position will let her clear Blue if, if it tries to set up. They jockeyed for position a bit more, and then David made hoop four for a three to one lead. Nobody's obliged to warn you if you're going for the wrong hoop, but they have to answer the question if you ask it, so don't hesitate to do that. And with all the balls at hoop five, She'll learn to hit this with a little more authority so it holds its line better. Morgan's going to hit a nice, precise little clearance on black, but she would have been better off using it on blue so that red would be able to stay in the jaws and set up for six on this hoop shot, maybe getting ready to make two hoops in a row. Judge for yourself, but I'm pretty sure this is a beveled edge. But since I wouldn't have criticized her for not calling a referee on this shot, I can't call it hampered, and therefore this is not a fault. I'll see if I can get Cheryl Bromley to watch this and weigh in in the comments section. This hoop shot on red ended up in no man's land. Too far through the hoop to hit a standard stroke without breaking your mallet, but not far enough to have any backswing. She has to hit it away at an angle or hit down on it to give it roll. Otherwise, you hear that obvious double tap when you use follow through to try to get it to go further. And that was a hampered shot, so it is a fault. That's the natural beginning. That's, that's how I hit it. 
She needs to clear black, but with the duck pin configuration, it's tempting just to roll a strike and start all over again at this hoop. Morgan setting the score straight. The convention is to announce the score with your score first when you make a hoop. But there's no rule about that. I slowed this down because I thought he was going to hit a beveled edge. Turns out he didn't, but he committed another fault. He hit red. Right. They should go back, and his turn's over. Right. You can overdo this, but you do have to hit the ball hard enough to hold its line. How hard that is depends on the playing conditions, of course. So much for your casting. Stanley, a couple markers. That was not intentional, nor should it have been, because Red has a pretty straightforward jump shot. Unfortunately, Morgan's jump shot wasn't ready for prime time, so we'll move on. Morgan tried to Barnes Wallace. At least she robbed Blue of the easy shot down to hoop eight. Can you think of a reason for going second? And again, this hampered hoop shot is a trap. If you don't hit down on it or hit it to the side, you're going to commit a fall. In this case, he tried to push at it, and the only reason he didn't double tap was that he hit a beveled edge. That's why he got some roll on it, but it was a mallet fall. Morgan has the makings of a lovely swing. Hands together at the top and a standard grip. Nice pivot from the shoulders. If she learns to let the mallet head swing a little more freely, she could be pretty good. So they both got down to hoop 10, and she's going to try to block by going through the hoop in reverse, which is pretty effective sometimes. In David's big split grip, as always, the bottom hand supplies the force, but it's coming in from the side, which has accuracy problems. Yellow and blue played to position. And now red can make the hoop. He rightfully expects blue to be gone, so he's got to try to do something about red with black. Okay. Clearing or blocking blue would be the first two choices for yellow here. 
Looks like she tried to advance right into the hoop, which is creative, but a low percentage shot. And once again, as they get more experienced, they'll learn that if you're going to do a straight clearance like that, you've got to send red far enough away that it can't easily come back and hurt you. She obviously knows that black plays next. She has to do something about it. And early on, people prefer blocking because for some reason they're intimidated by clearance shots, even a short one like that. Morgan couldn't escape that gaggle of balls with red. David gets off a pretty good shot going for who? Nine. Black is in such good position that she needs to be shooting to clear black with both yellow and red, but that's a bit much to ask at this point, I think. Another beveled edge causing a shank, but as you know by now, if it's not hampered, it's not a fault. Ooh, nice try. It's, it's five. Okay. The confidence to do this comes with experience, but that ball is straight on and close enough to the hoop that he should hit it hard enough to get it down to hoop 10. But of course, only after having the double bank blue stripe ball marked and lifted. David's got six hoops. He gets another one, he wins. Let's see how long she can last. As they work their way to hoop 10, David does it the right way this time. He had no other shot. That ball was so hampered. This next shot is the fault only if he made a divot in the grass deep enough to affect a ball rolling over it before it was repaired. If it was outside the line, then it's not a fault. After Morgan made 10, their approach shots led to this configuration. Red's on the right stanchion a little bit, so a jump shot here is a good choice. I guess that's what he's trying to do. But rushing blue beyond the hoop like that is actually a pretty good choice because now it can knock Red out of position. This comes up all the time, and it's frequently the only option when your opponent has a ball in the hoop. It's blue to play, and we didn't notice it. Black just play. But not realizing that black was the wrong ball leaves blue a lot closer to hoop twelve. I just shot blue. So 
So that's the second of the four hoops you needed to catch up and win. But not recognizing that wrong ball fall helped a little bit with this excellent shot by David. And now Red's only option is a double bouncing jump shot. Where is Ben Rothman when you need him? Get on YouTube, check out Ben Rothman Crow K for the jump shot, and then Google Barnes Wallace bouncing bomb. The history buffs will love it. So, Yellow is completely hampered by hoop 11. Only really has to do is set up, but he's not waiting around for that. And David Watson for the win, seven to five. You stayed around this long, you may have learned something from this game. And now another highlight clip. We join a game at hoop 12 where Alex Worley has five hoops and Debbie Gatsi has six. She's about to take what should be the winning shot with yellow. Alex plays for Oklahoma Wesleyan. And Debbie is a member of the Tulsa Croquet Club. They both look like they've played a fair amount. Alex must be a good athlete because good shots like that are hard to do with a split grip. Strong clearance here is a great tactical idea because it puts red as far from hoop 13 as possible. Wow. And it's six all. Check out Clark Croquet, the website, Clark with an E. Chris Clark has an excellent discussion of Hoop 12 tactics. At championship level, the first player to Hoop 13 has probably a 70% chance of winning the game. But you got to get past the hoop. She must have shanked blue because it wasn't hampered.
Ma'am, did we? Did you get? We want to see this jump shot on the camera. Can okay. we get you to move this a little bit? Thank you. <laughs> no pressure, of course. All right, Alex yeah. Worley over Debbie Gansi with a pressure jump shot at hoop 13. She fixes that split grip. She's going to be good. As will all the developing players if they get their hands together, no matter what grip they use, let the mallet head swing freely and do it now before your bad habits are set in concrete. These four are part of the team that won the most recent collegiate nationals for Oklahoma Wesleyan University. And also on that team was Stanley Fisher, who's featured in the next video. And now some breaking news. I'm recording this on October the 10th. After this tournament six weeks ago, I mentioned it to Damon Bidencope, our president, who said, hey, we need more players for the under-21s in New Zealand in February. Phone called Anna Hansen and Stuart Price got things going. And... I talked to Steve Fisher on the phone today and found out that these kids got invited to Sarasota for an intense makeover of their games. Jeff Sue, Mike Albert, and the last two world champions, Matthew Essick and Ben Rothman, produced the result you see here. And this total transformation is a tribute to these kids' willingness to listen and learn. And they found out yesterday that Stanley and Alex have been invited to play in the under-21s in New Zealand in February. I feel so fortunate to be a part of this community that plays croquet. And now with apologies to Morgan Lane, I could not resist this illustration of Generation Z waiting respectfully but not quite patiently for the baby boomer, my generation, to make up its mind. So if you enjoyed this, subscribe, give us a like, hit the notification bell. There's more to come from the Tulsa Croquet Club.